Good morning and welcome to Worship at Christ Church. We have lots of things going on in the life of the church right now. This weekend we are back to offering in-person worship on Saturday evenings at 6 and Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock for the contemporary service and 11 o'clock for the traditional service. If you're coming to worship in person, we ask that you please sign up online at ChristUMC.net slash worship. Our online services will also continue as is, so if you're not comfortable coming out yet, you can still worship from home. Fish Fry Fridays are back. We got off to a great start this past Friday and will continue for Fridays throughout Lent. You can come by for lunch from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. or dinner from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. Check out ChristUMC.net slash fish fry for the delicious menu options. This year is a little bit different. Everything is drive through takeout, but we've got a great system ready to serve you quickly and efficiently. Our youth group is also back in person starting Sunday, the 21st of February. The schedule will change slightly because of this return to the building. So please make sure you check out ChristUMC.net slash youth for all of the details on the youth group. The Bible adventure continues. We have made it through the first five books of the Bible and are now into Joshua in our quest to read through the Bible in a year as a congregation. Just a reminder that you can join in the reading and a Bible adventure small group at any time. You'll find details on the reading plan and the different groups at ChristUMC.net slash Bible adventure. Finally, we wanna make it easy for you to know about the big events going on in the life of the church. So we invite you to text the word MORE to the number that you see on your screen right now. When you do, you'll get a link to our announcements page texted to you every weekend so that you can learn more about things like what I've mentioned here and keep up to date on other things that are happening in the life of Christ Church. Good morning. I invite you to join me in this call to worship and act of praise. Lead us in the way of truth, O God. Show us your holy pathways. Your way is steadfast love and faithfulness. Teach us to follow where you lead. We trust in your way, O Lord. To you, we lift up our souls. Take up thy cross, the Savior said, if thou wouldst my disciple be. Deny thyself, the world forsake, and humbly follow after me. Take up thy cross, let not its weight fill thy weak spirit with alarm. His strength shall bear thy spirit up, and brace thy heart, and nerve thine arm. Take up thy cross, nor heed the shame, nor let thy foolish pride rebel. Thy Lord for thee the cross endured to save thy soul from death and hell. Take up thy cross and follow Christ, nor think till death to lay it down. For only those who bear the cross may hope to wear the glorious crown.
Thank you for joining us in worship today as we continue on the Bible adventure together. We are so grateful for all the ways God is leading us as Christ Church to connect, grow, and give. Thank you to each and every one of you who are faithfully mailing your tithes and offerings into the church or continue to give through our secure online giving platform. Your faithful support of Christ Church allows us to impact the lives of individuals and families throughout our church, our community, our city, and the world. Your generosity is making a difference. If you want to start giving, you can access online giving by visiting the church website at ChristUMC.net or mail your gift to the church. Everything we have is a gift from God. May God continue to bless and multiply all of our gifts for the work of spreading his transforming love. Good morning. As we join in a time of prayer this morning, I would encourage you to send your prayer concerns to ChristUMC.net and our prayer concerns button or to call the church and share your prayer concerns with us. Won't you join me this morning as we pray? Lord God, I thank you so much that you are a faithful God and that you are a God who is continually with us, walking with us through our life as we go through it. There are many things that we face that we may not be able to comprehend or understand why we're going through them. But Lord, I pray that you can help our hearts to have that kingdom sight, to see what it is that you are doing, that you have a plan for us, even in the hardest of times, Lord, that you are still there and you are still faithful. Lord God, we thank you for your salvation. We thank you for the way that you have made through your son that all can come to know that salvation. Lord, be with us as we continue to worship this morning. Guide our hearts to continually search out your will and walk in your way. Won't you join me as we pray the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the glory forever. Amen.
Our scripture this morning is taken from Ruth chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. Hear these words. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Well, good morning. Welcome to the first week of Lent. First, I want to say thank you for taking part in our Bible adventure as we read through the entire Bible during this year. If you haven't started yet or still need a daily reading list, you can grab it at ChristUMC.net slash Bible Adventure. And you can access all of our resources there for this adventure as well. One of the things we've tried to do as part of our Bible adventure is to have our readings, our sermons, and our Wednesday night C3s line up. Now, in order to keep us moving, this week the sermon's actually going to look a little bit ahead of where you are in the reading. But don't panic. The C3s will fill in the gaps, and once you get to the readings, you'll actually have a little bit of pre-knowledge. My prayer is that as we continue to look through the Old Testament, you're beginning to see the foundations that are being laid and the foreshadowing that is occurring for when Jesus comes and for when we get to the New Testament. So hang in there. As we continue to look back... I wonder, does anybody besides me ever have a problem remembering things? You know, that reminds me of a story that I heard a former pastor of mine share about a husband and wife who who were having problems remembering things. So they decided to go to the doctor. The doctor encouraged them to begin writing things down to see if that would help their memory. So later that night, while they were at home watching TV, the husband got up from his chair And he started toward the kitchen. His wife asked, where are you going? Well, I'm going to the kitchen to get some ice cream, he answered. And she asked, well, would you get me a bowl while you're in there? The husband replied, sure. Now, the wife, remembering what the doctor had said earlier in that day, said, don't you think you should write it down so that you can remember it? The husband rolled his eyes and he said, no, I think I can remember that. Well, the wife said, I would also like some strawberries on top. So you better write that down because I know you'll forget that. And he's like, no, no, I won't forget. He assured her. Okay, well, I also want some whipped cream on top. And I know you'll forget that, so you better write that down. Now, at this point, the husband was obviously getting irritated, but he managed to say rather nicely, I don't think I need to write that down. I can remember it. About 20 minutes later, he returned from the kitchen and handed her a plate of bacon and eggs. And she stared at it for a moment and then said, see, I knew you couldn't remember. You forgot my toast. (laughs) Some of you will get that in a minute. You see, the older we get, the harder it is to remember things. And that's why we have to write almost everything down. And as we've learned along the way during our Bible adventure, the writings from the Bible are God's way of writing things down so that we don't forget. The reason that the Old Testament is not irrelevant, but rather is actually really relevant, is because it helps us remember what God has been doing all along. Now, before I jump into our new Bible adventure series for Lent called The Cross-Shaped Life, Holy Character from Royal Heroes, I want to take a second and give a quick overview of the books of Joshua and Judges, just to help bridge the gap between the Road Rules series and our new Lenten series. Also, let me remind you that the the next two C3s will discuss at a much deeper level the books of Joshua and Judges as well. Our special guest will be Dr. Jerome Creech, who's an Old Testament scholar and an expert on the topic of violence in Scripture, which the books of Joshua and Judges are full of. So be sure to tune in on Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. to hear Dr. Creech share his insights with us. Now, we're going to cover a lot of information today. But as we do, I want to encourage you to listen for the foundation and foreshadowing that points us to Jesus. Are you ready? All right, here we go. 
Deuteronomy ends with the nation of Israel still wandering around in the wilderness, not yet entering the promised land. Now, the book of Joshua begins a new section in the Old Testament known as the 12 historical books. This period covers covers approximately a thousand years. As we come to the book of Joshua, a new generation is standing on the banks of the Jordan, wondering if they have the faith to do what their parents did not. This group of some two million people is poised to claim the promises of God. But at the same time, they're probably also frightened that they may commit the same sin as their parents, who ended up dying because of their disobedience outside of the promised land. They're in a tough spot because their leader, Moses, is now dead. But they're on the verge of victory with only the Jordan River standing between them and the land flowing with milk and honey. Now, they're not proud of their past, but they're also frightened about their future. Can you relate? Maybe you're afraid of turning out just like your ancestors did. Or as you review the past year, maybe you know you didn't make the progress that you wanted to. Maybe you've just been wandering in the wilderness, experiencing more failure than faithfulness. Well, no matter what your story is, now is the time to move forward and cross the Jordan River, so to speak, and enter in to your promised land. You see, the only thing that stands between the Israelites and the promised land is the Jordan River. Now, it's important to understand some things about the Jordan River. This river starts on Mount Hermon at an elevation of 7,000 feet, and it ends at the Dead Sea, which is about 1,200 feet below sea level. The distance between the beginning and the end is about 70 miles. But if you count all the twists and the turns, it actually travels probably about 200 miles. In the spring, when the snow melts, the water in the Jordan River flows rapidly, cascading over 25 known rapids. Some scholars have pointed out that the name Jordan in Hebrew actually means river that descends rapidly. Now, normally, it's pretty easy to cross the Jordan. But during flood season in the spring, it was treacherous. And it would even fill a second and larger area called the Zor Gorge. In some sections of the river, the distance across would actually swell to over two miles. On top of that, the banks of the gorge are essentially perpendicular. Now, as you read through the book of Joshua, it's important to note that God calls his people to cross the Jordan in the springtime when it is precisely at its most dangerous and when it seems like it's the most impossible. You'll read about that in Joshua 3. Now remember, the Jordan served as a boundary between what the Israelites presently had and what God had promised them on the other side. I wonder, what is our Jordan River today? What barriers are we facing? Where is God asking us to take a step of faith if we're not sure? We should ask ourselves this question if we don't know. What am I afraid of? You see, our fear will tell us the barriers that we are actually facing. And then once we know them, we can ask God for help. Now, the rest of the book of Joshua tells the story of the Israelites overcoming their fear and following God into the promised land. Then we get to the book of Judges. And again, be sure to tune in to C3 for a deeper dive into both of these books. But the book of Judges is the second book of history, and it's full of wise warnings and and just a few encouraging examples. This book chronicles a very tough time in the history of Israel, serving as a hinge between the successes of Joshua and the establishment of the monarchy in 1 Samuel. It covers about 400 years, and during that time, God's people progressively drift away from the Lord. Judges 2, verses 18 and 19, summarizes their spiritual situation. They say, when, whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord relented because of their groaning under those who opp- oppressed and afflicted them. But when the judge died, the people returned to ways even more corrupt than those of their ancestors following other gods and serving and worshiping them. They refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. They were on a slippery downward cycle of sin. 
The very last phrase of the book of Judges gives us insight into the way things were going south. Judges 21, 25 says, everyone did as they saw fit. And because of that, on several different occasions, we read about God's people cycling through a period of rebellion, which led to retribution from God. And then after suffering for some time, they would eventually cry out to God and then be restored to a time of rest and peace. But then they begin that process all over again. Do you recognize that pattern? It's that same pattern we've talked about since in the beginning in Genesis, and it will carry through the entire Bible. Receive a blessing, screw it up, are punished, cry out, God restores, repeat. You see, in reality, the book of Judges is a photo gallery of ordinary and average people who accomplish some pretty extraordinary things. If you were here on Wednesday night for our Ash Wednesday service, you heard Pastor Diane preach about one of those average people who did extraordinary things, the Judge Deborah. Now, if you couldn't join us, you can still watch her sermon by going to our website at ChristUMC.net. Now, I know that was a quick overview from 30,000 feet about Joshua and Judges. But hopefully it gives you a little background as we head into our new series for Lent called The Cross-Shaped Life. Holy character from royal heroes. This week, as we read in our scripture, we're looking at the life of Ruth. Now, the book of Ruth follows the book of Judges in the Bible, but it actually takes place during the Judges period. Now, over the next several weeks, as we approach Easter, we're going to be looking at different royal heroes and the character that they showed that can help us grow our character as we follow God's leading. Many people have said that the book of Ruth is the most moving short story ever written. It's known for its beauty and its brevity. It begins with despair and it ends with delight. While known as a book of loyalty and love, it's much more than that. We're going to discover that God moves in ways that we often can't see, working all things together through the seemingly small events and occurrences of our life. The events of Ruth take place during a tumultuous time when the judges ruled in Israel. Like a light in the darkness or a bright star in the night sky, Ruth shines during a very dark and bleak period. Don't forget that as you come to the book of Ruth as part of your Bible adventure reading. You see, in order to catch the flavor of the book, the story is framed for us in the very first verse. It says, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. So we go from everyone did as they saw fit to in the days when the judges ruled. Now, you may remember Moab from your previous reading. This was a period in which God's people would move from disobedience to defeat to deliverance. Because everyone did what was right in his or her own eyes. Sin was rampant and God's people had hardened hearts. Now we need to remember that Moab was a land of rich soil and adequate rainfall. So this family would have traveled north to Jerusalem and then crossed the Jordan River at the fords by Jericho. Seeing these sites should have jogged their memories of God's faithfulness of when they crossed back in Joshua. It's important to know that Moab was an extreme enemy of Israel. Why? Well, because the Moabites mistreated the Israelites when they left Egypt. Back in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 3 through 6, there are laid out some pretty strong words against Moab. It says, No Ammonite or Moabite or any of his descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord, even down to the tenth generation. For they did not come to meet you with bread and water on your way when you came out of Egypt. Do not seek a treaty of friendship with them as long as you live. And then again in Numbers 25, we read about the Moabites and how they led Israel into sexual immorality and pagan worship. So there was this 10 generation curse placed on the people of Moab during the days of Moses. This man in Ruth is trying to flee the judgment of God on Israel through the famine and is disobeying doubly by going to live among the Moabites. 
Now, in order to better understand the story, let me introduce you to the main characters. The Israelite man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi. They had two sons who married Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. When we come to chapter 2, we're introduced to a man named Boaz, who was a relative of Elimelech. And we'll get to him in a minute. During their stay in Moab, Naomi's husband dies. And then about 10 years later, their two sons also die. So Naomi, Orpah, and Ruth are now widows. After hearing that there is now food again in Bethlehem, Naomi and her two daughters-in-law set out for this journey to Judah. Naomi is deciding to go home. Orpah and Ruth are with her, and she tells them to go back to their mother's home. In fact, in verse 9, it says they all wept aloud, but they still wanted to go with her. And Naomi then reminds them that they won't have a future with her because they're Moabite. And verse 14 says they wept again. Orpah chooses comfort. When she considers the cost, she says, "Eh, it's too much. She recognizes that Naomi will never be able to provide for all of her needs. And so she bails on going to Bethlehem. Orpah had some sort of emotional experience, clearly, but it wasn't enough to sustain her. wonder if that describes anyone here today. You know, it's so easy to return to old habits, isn't it? Orpah had tears, but they, they were tears of regret. Now, Ruth, Ruth makes a commitment. Ruth counts the cost, and she concludes that it's worth it in verse 14. And it says that she clung to Naomi. And there's perhaps no greater statement of loyalty and devotion and dedication in the entire Bible than what is found in Ruth 1, 16 and 17. Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. In verse 17, she actually uses the name of Israel's God, meaning that Ruth must have learned about him from Naomi. Ruth's tears were tears of redemption. She was loyal not only to Naomi, but to the God of Israel. Now, Naomi, she's conflicted. She's so low that she actually changes her name from Naomi, which means pleasant, to Mara, which means bitter. And she's running away from God. And that often produces bitterness. In fact, in verse 19, we see that the people in Bethlehem are stirred at some women, and some of the women in Bethlehem actually ask if it is Naomi because the decade had been so hard on her. She was just beat. She's a shadow of her former self. And in verse 20, she blames God for her bitterness. She left with a full life, and now God made her empty. That's pretty easy to exaggerate our hopelessness when we're feeling down. It's almost... Better to say with Naomi, this is bitter for me, than it is to say, this is better for me. Bitterness has a way of blocking out any blessing that God's trying to give us. I think when Naomi cried, her tears were tears of repentance. She knows there's nothing for her in Moab. And so she turns and returns home. Now, things are starting to look up at the end of chapter 1. Even though she can't see it, God is providentially preparing to meet her needs in a way she can't even imagine. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth, the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. They own nothing. And God is doing what God does for his glory and for her good. First, she's returning to Bethlehem. She's getting to go home. Second, she's not alone because Ruth is with her. And third, they're returning during the beginning of a harvest. And you might ask, why is that important? Well, let me explain. This shows how God is at work even when we can't see it. We're introduced to the relative of Elimelech named Boaz in the first verse of chapter 2. And we're told he's known as a man of standing, which literally means he was a mighty man, having the finest qualities. John Piper refers to him as a God-saturated man. In verse 2, we see that Ruth is ready to work while Naomi is still weeping. And then in verse 7, we learn that she works steadily from the morning. Now remember from our reading before that God has always made provision for the poor and destitute by telling farmers to leave some harvest behind during harvest time. 
Back in Leviticus 19, verses 9 and 10, it says, When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. In verse 3, we read that Ruth just happened to find herself in a field that belonged to Boaz. Now, as it turned out, she found herself working. And according to scholars, the, the Hebrew reads this way. She chanced a chance. Now, think about that. God is orchestrating events in order to accomplish God's purpose. God's invisible hand steered her to that particular field on that particular day. Haddon Robinson puts it this way in one of his sermons. Step where we cannot see so that we can undergo what we can't understand. You see, Ruth is continuing to show loyalty in the midst of her situation by her willingness to work. And then we see Boaz, and he goes out of his way to care for Ruth. He gives her extra provision, and he even asks her out for lunch, really, the first day that he meets her. You see, even when we're completely unaware of what is happening, or even why something is happening, God is guiding our decisions and our actions. Ruth is working hard, and God is constantly at work behind the scenes. Our responsibility is to surrender to God's sovereignty and to be loyal to God's leading. The Heidelberg Catechism puts it this way, I trust God so much that I do not doubt God will provide whatever I need for body and soul, and God will turn to my good whatever adversity God sends me in this sad world. God is able to do this because he is almighty God. God desires to do this because God is a faithful father. Have we surrendered to God's sovereignty? Do we trust God's purposes for our life, even when things look bleak? Are we working while at the same time watching God do what God does? Have we discovered the glories of God's happenings in our life? Now, chapter three may make you scratch your head a little bit. Naomi tells Ruth to take a bath, put on some perfume, and dress in her finest clothes. She then goes to the threshing floor, and when Boaz falls asleep, Ruth takes the covers off his feet. When Boaz turns over in the middle of the night, he discovers this woman lying at his feet and wants to know who she is. And in verse 9, she says, I am your servant, Ruth. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. Now, Ruth is asking Boaz to shelter her under his protection and to redeem her. In short, She's actually making a marriage proposal to him. Now, to understand what is going on here, it's important to know a few things about the guardian redeemer concept, because you may have never heard of that before. Since God had assigned each family of each tribe a section of land, land was extremely important to Israel. In order to make sure the land stayed in the family, the guardian redeemer law was instituted. If a man died and left a widow and no sons, his nearest relative would be given the opportunity to buy his land and marry his widow so that she could have sons and carry on the deceased name. Now, this relative would be obligated at his own expense to buy back the property and return it to the relative who had sold it. If the nearest relative refused, then the next closest kin would take on the role of the redeemer. There was one catch, however. The guardian redeemer couldn't make the decision to redeem on his own. He had to be asked by the widow to buy back her husband's land. Now that helps to explain what takes place here in chapter three between Ruth and Boaz. You see, Naomi understands all of this. And so she kind of launched into her matchmaking plan. But she also knew that she had to be patient and wait on the Lord. And we're told in verse 18 of chapter 3, Wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens. For the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. So she submitted to God's sovereignty. Now, Boaz is not the next in line. There's someone else. So Boaz has to ask him first. And God works all this out in an amazing way. But there's still a little bit of waiting involved. I wonder, how are we doing at waiting 
while God does what God does for his glory and for our good. Then we get to chapter four. Boaz goes to the city gates and he sits down to conduct business with the man who has the legal right to care for Naomi and Ruth. Now, it's important to realize that the gate of the city was like a courthouse. That's where transactions took place and that's where cases were heard. At first, this man was willing, but when he realizes that the decision will adversely affect his own family, he allows Boaz to become the redeemer. And this is interesting. I learned this just this year. In order to publicly seal a transaction, verse 8 tells us that he removed his sandal. The giving of a sandal was like a signed contract back then, especially in cases where land was in dispute. You see, this originated because someone would walk off a field in their sandals in order to measure it. Boaz then redeems Naomi, and he marries Ruth. The Bible says that we need someone to rescue us from the slippery slope of sin. Now, you might think that you can't possibly be forgiven for what you've done. That's not true. God can forgive anyone. God forgave a Moabite, and God can give you a fresh start as well. However, just as Ruth needed to ask for redemption, we too need to ask God to redeem us through Jesus. In the Old Testament, A redeemer must be related by blood. He must be able to pay the redemption price, and he must be willing to do so, just like Boaz was. John 1.14 says that Jesus took on flesh and blood so that he could relate to us. Jesus is able to redeem because he paid the price for our redemption. The book of Ruth actually concludes with a genealogy. Did you know that there are actually 41 separate genealogies from Genesis to Revelation? Have you ever stopped to wonder why? These family trees are really faith albums of God's promises to God's people. You see, God made a promise way back in Genesis to Abraham that all families would be blessed through him. And now God has grafted in individuals like Rahab and Ruth that you will read about in order to bring David into the world, who we'll talk about in a couple of weeks. Naomi's now cared for and is found holding her grandson Obed at the end of the story, out of whom the line of David will actually come. Then, when we come to the New Testament in Matthew 1, we see that the lineage of Boaz and Ruth from Bethlehem ended up in David's greater son, born of a virgin in a stable in Bethlehem. There's something far greater going on here. Life's not always a straight line, right? God is a God of movement. And there's no such thing as an ordinary event in life when God is involved. Ultimately, in the book of Ruth, we see Ruth go from being a Moabite woman destined to receive a curse to a redeemed woman because of her marriage to Boaz, her guardian redeemer. No matter how unworthy we feel or how destined to receive a curse we think we are, God can give us a second chance. For Ruth, it came from her marriage to Boaz. For us, it comes from our relationship with Jesus, who becomes our Redeemer through his work on the cross. Once we receive that second chance, we have the wherewithal to show our loyalty to God through our redeemed character, just like Ruth did. Let's pray. Lord, we are grateful. We are grateful that no matter what we do, we have a way back to you. We can be redeemed. We can be forgiven. The story of Ruth is the story of a guardian redeemer that redeems Ruth. For us, as we enter into this Lenten season and we look to the cross, we're reminded of our redeemer who can redeem us no matter what we've done in our past. But we have to ask, The gift is there. It's free. We just have to ask to receive it. So as we begin our Lenten journey, my prayer this morning is that we take the time to ask God for that free gift of his grace so that we can be redeemed and restored and grow in our character and begin to share that light and love with others. I ask all this in our Redeemer's name. Jesus. 
Amen. If you have not already, please go to ChristUMC.net and sign in using our attendance button. You can also share a prayer concern or giving using these buttons on the homepage as well. It is great to be reading through the Bible together as church during 2021. On our website, you can find the daily reading plan, follow up questions, and even sign up to join a Bible adventure small group to discuss what you're reading. It's never too late to join in the fun. Thank you for all the ways you live out your faith as we continue building inclusive community, sharing Christ's transforming love. Standing beneath the cross of Jesus as we observe the season of Lent is a sobering experience. For the cross judges both our world and our individual lives. Today, people are still crucified by the same forces that destroyed Jesus. Today, each of us falls short of the resolve and dedication to God, which Jesus exhibited by the way he lived and died. So let us, as men and women who live in a twisted world and who are all too weak in spirit, join together in the prayer of confession. We surround ourselves with crosses, O oh God. 
Yet we confess that we shrink back from the awareness that your glory is revealed in the criminal's cross of Jesus Christ. Help us to know your presence wherever there is suffering in our world. May may we be channels of your love and healing so that you may not suffer needlessly. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our God renews and restores us in loving kindness. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Thank you for joining us for worship today. Uh, I'm so glad that you decided to, to make us part of your day as we begin this Lenten season. Man, there's so much here, right? As we go through all these books, it can become a little overwhelming. But remember, the story back then is for us to remember. Remember what God did and use that to look forward to what God is doing. So just like Ruth was able to be redeemed through her relationship with Boaz, we're able to be redeemed through our relationship with Jesus. I pray you receive that today. I pray it changes your life. And I invite you to join us next week as we continue on in our Bible adventure journey together. God bless.